Good morning, my sea turtles. Here is for video two of this week. Um, just letting you go that I miss you guys so much, and I really wish that I was doing this in person, but I'm kind of liking this whole YouTube thing. So I hope that you are watching and learning, and we are going to continue on area and perimeter today. So just to go ahead and give you a recap, that area is the amount of square units inside of a shape. Yesterday, we talked about John and his garden, and we talked about him trying to figure out the space in his garden that he needed to plant his plants. That's area, because that's dealing with the inside. Then we have the perimeter, and that's the distance around the shapes. So dealing with John's garden again, when we had that problem with his fence, that was perimeter because it was around. It had nothing to do with what was on the inside. So, kind of to bring it up a notch, because I know you guys are super smart, we're now going to be focusing on area and perimeter word problems. And this is where it gets tricky because the word problems aren't going to tell you to either use area or perimeter. You're going to have to figure out which one to use based on am I finding out what's around the shape or am I finding out what's on the inside of the shape? So we're just going to go ahead with two and then you have more on your Google Doc of how you need to practice. So we're going to start off with this one. It says Nicole is walking around the playground. The playground is a rectangle that is 20 feet by 9 feet. She walked four laps how many feet did she walk? So we need to be thinking, this problem doesn't tell us find the area or find the perimeter. It's just asking us a question and we need to figure out, well, it, is it the distance around something that she's walking or is it the inside of something that she's walking? So take a look at this problem for a minute. Think to yourself, am I doing area or perimeter? Hmm. So if you said perimeter, you are absolutely right. Because she's walking around, it says right here, around the playground. So she's not walking in the playground, it's like she's walking along the fence, okay? So it said it's 20 feet by nine feet. So if I go ahead and draw this, okay? Oh gosh, that was not a good rectangle. Say this is my nine feet right here. This is my 20 feet. And we know opposite sides, same length, so I can go ahead and finish labeling that. And perimeter, you add up all the sides. So we're not multiplying with this one, we are adding. So we'll do 20 plus 20, and then we'll do 9 plus 9. So we get 40, we get 18. And then we'll add that together. Zero plus eight, eight of course, four plus one is five. So the perimeter of one lap is 58 feet. But this problem is trying to trick you. She walked four laps. So if one lap is 58 feet, what are we gonna have to do to figure out four laps? Well think, it's repeated addition. 58 plus another 58 plus another 58 plus another 58. Repeated addition is the same thing as multiplication. So we are going to go ahead and do 58 times 4. 8 times 4, we get 32. Drop that 2 down. Carry that 3. 5 times 4 is 20. Plus 3 is 23. Bring that all down. So Nicole here ended up walking 232 feet for those four laps that she ended up walking all around the playground. So this problem was a perimeter problem because again, she was walking around. It had nothing to do with the inside of the playground. So now, switching directions over here, we're talking about Miss Sherrett, our beloved art teacher. So Miss Sherrett is painting a wall mural the wall that she gets to paint is 15 feet by 10 feet. How much space does Miss Sherrett have to paint? So we need to be thinking, hmm, are we doing perimeter or area? So I want you to kind of put yourself in this word problem. You're Miss Sherrett 
if you were painting a mural on a wall, are we focusing just on the outside or are we focusing on what's on the inside too? Think about it for a sec. So, you are right. You're painting the whole wall, the whole entire inside portion of the wall. So this one is an area problem. All right, so what we are gonna do here, let me switch it back over, is that we are going to take our 15 feet and our 10 feet and think back, what is our formula for area, right? It's multiplication, so we're multiplying this 15 by 10. And don't get freaked out that these are bigger numbers because remember, take the zero off for a second. Well, we know 15 times one is 15, and then add that zero back. So she actually has 150 feet squared to paint. Because remember, this is the inside, the whole wall. So that's why it is area. Okay, so make sure that the biggest thing you remember, I can't stress this enough with figuring out area and perimeter, area is the inside of the shape, so Miss Sherrod painting that wall, John figuring out how much space he has in his garden, and then perimeter is the outside part. Okay, Nicole walking those laps around the playground, John getting that fence for his garden. So this is where you can pause the video and you can work on your math problems in the Google document if you want to. All right, because now I'm going on and we are picking up where we left off with the number, the stars. So we left off in a spot that was kind of suspenseful in my opinion. All right, they were having that funeral and we know it isn't really a funeral. And Ellen's reunited with her parents, the German soldiers come in because they know something's a little fishy. They're like, hmm, there's a lot of people gathering here. That seems suspicious. And of course, they were right. It is very suspicious. They demand to see Great Aunt Birdie in the casket. Well, Anna Marie's mom, being the smart woman that she is, ends up telling a little lie to the German soldiers, saying that Great Aunt Birdie had typhus, and that's why they had the casket closed. And typhus is a very contagious disease, so she knew by saying that, the German soldiers aren't going to want to open it because they're not going to want to catch that. And she was right. Unfortunately, they weren't very nice about it, and they got physical with Anna Marie's mother um, and actually slapped her across the face, which was a very dramatic part in the chapter. So last time we were focusing on character changes. Okay, we, a lot of you, I read your responses and you mentioned how Anne Marie's mother had changed and I think that's an awesome character to focus on since she did have that dramatic scene in the chapter. This time, I want us to really focus on character actions and what they tell us about the character, their character traits. I want us to really focus in on Peter. I know he's not really a main character, but he's really starting to come into his own in this chapter. So while we are reading, focus on Peter and the actions that he's showing. What does this tell us about him? All right, be thinking about Peter. Peter stood and drew the dark curtains across the windows. He relit the extinguished candle. Then he reached for the old Bible that had always been there. He opened it quickly and said, I will read a psalm. His eyes turned to the page he had opened at random, and he began to read in a strong voice. Oh, praise the Lord! How good it is to sing psalms of our God! How pleasant to praise him! The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem. He gathers in the scattered sons of Israel. It is he who heals the broken in spirit and binds up their wounds. He who numbers the stars one by one. So, as a reader, I just had a light bulb go off in my head. The book title is Number of the Stars. And this psalm that Peter just read out of the Bible mentions it. I'll read it one more time. Oh, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing psalms to our God. How pleasant to praise him. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem. He gathers in the scattered sons of Israel. 
It is he who heals the broken in spirit and binds up their wounds. He who numbers the stars one by one. So there's something important about this psalm in the Bible that connects back to the title of the book. So Anne-Marie must have a strong relationship with this psalm in order for it to probably come about later on in the book too. Let's see. Mama sat down and listened. Gradually, they each began to relax. Anne-Marie could see the old man across the room, moving his lips as Peter read. He knew the ancient psalm by heart. Anne-Marie didn't. The words were unfamiliar to her, and she tried to listen, tried to understand, tried to forget the war and the Nazis, tried not to cry, tried to be brave. The night breeze moved the dark curtains at the open windows. Outside, she knew the sky was speckled with stars. How could anyone number them one by one, as the psalm had said? There were too many. The sky was too big. Ellen had said that her mother was frightened of the ocean, that it was too cold and too big. But the sky was too, thought Anne-Marie. The whole world was too cold, too big, too cruel. Peter read on in his firm voice, though it was clear he was tired. The long minutes passed. They seemed like hours. Finally, still reading, he moved quietly to the window. He closed the Bible and listened to the quiet night. Then he looked around the room. Now, he said, it is time. First he closed the windows, then he went to the casket and opened the lid. Looks like we're about to actually see what was in the casket. Was there a body? Was there not? Anne-Marie blinked. Across the dark room, she saw Ellen, too, peering into the narrow wooden box in surprise. There was no one in the casket at all. Instead, it seemed to be stuffed with folded blankets and old clothing. Peter began to lift the things out and distribute them to the silent people in the room. He handed heavy coats to the man and wife, and another to the old man and the beard. It will be very cold, he murmured. Put them on. He found a thick sweater for Mrs. Rosen and a woolen jacket for Ellen's father. After a moment of rummaging through the folded things, he found a smaller winter jacket and handed it to Ellen. So we see Peter has all these clothes in the casket and he's handing them out to the people who had come to this funeral one by one. I want you to think, why are they going to need these clothes? Why are Peter, why is Peter giving them these clothes if they're already wearing clothes? I want you to be thinking about that. Why might they need more clothes? Anne-Marie watched as Ellen took the jacket in her arms and looked at it. It was patched and worn. It was true that there had been a few new clothes for anyone during the recent years, but still, Ellen's mother had always managed to make clothes for her daughter, often using old things that she was able to take apart and refashion in a way that made them seem brand new. Never had Ellen worn anything so shabby and old. But she put it on, pulled it around her and buttoned the mismatched buttons. Peter, his arm full of old pieces of clothing, looked toward the silent couple with the infant. Sorry, he said to them. There is nothing for a baby. I'll find something, Mama said quickly. The baby must be warm. She left the room and was back in a moment with Kirsty's thick red sweater. Here, she said softly to the mother. It will be much too big, but... That will make it even warmer for him. The woman finally spoke for the first time. Her, she whispered. She's a girl. Her name is Rachel. Mama smiled and helped her direct the sleeping baby's arms into the sleeves of the sweater. Together, they buttoned the heart-shaped buttons. How Christy loved this sweater with its heart buttons. But until the tiny child was completely encased in the warm red wool. Her eyelids fluttered, but she didn't wake. Peter reached into his pocket and took something out. He went to the parents and leaned down toward the baby. He opened the lid of the small bottle in his hand. How much does she weigh? Peter asked. Well, she was seven pounds when she was born, the young woman replied. She's gained a little, but not very much. Maybe she weighs eight pounds now? Not more than that. A few drops will be enough then. It has no taste. She won't even notice. So think. Peter has this bottle. We don't know what it's of. And he's asking how much she weighs. Talking about drops. 
what might this be that Peter is trying to give to this baby? And why is he trying to give this to the baby? The mother tightened her arms around the baby and looked up at Peter, pleading. Please no, she said. She always sleeps all night. Please, she doesn't need it. I promise she won't cry. Peter's voice was firm. We can't take a chance, he said. He inserted the dropper of the bottle into the baby's tiny mouth and squeezed a few drops of liquid onto her tongue. The baby yawned and swallowed. The mother closed her eyes. Her husband gripped her shoulder. So, whatever Peter just gave the baby, it is some kind of medicine to help the baby sleep. Because think, if they're all trying to escape or hide from the German soldiers, a baby doesn't know that, so they're not going to know not to cry. So this sleeping medication that Peter is giving her is so that they are able to flee or get away from the German soldiers without the baby crying and kind of giving up their cover. Next, Peter removed the folded blankets from the coffin one by one and handed them around. Carry these with you, he said. You will need them later for warmth. Anne Marie's mother moved around the room and gave each person a small package of food. The cheese and bread and apples that Anne Marie had helped her prepare in the kitchen just hours before. Finally, Peter took a paper wrapped packet from the inside of his own jacket. He looked around the room at the assembled people now dressed in the bulky winter clothing and then motioned to Mr. Rosen who followed him into the hall. Anne-Marie could overhear their conversation. Mr. Rosen, Peter said, I must get this to Henrik, but I might not see him. I'm going to take the others only to the harbor, and they will get on the boat alone. I want you to deliver this. Without fail, it is of great importance. There was a moment of silence in the hallway, and Marie knew that Peter must be giving the packet to Mr. Rosen. Anne-Marie could see it protruding, from Mr. Rosen's pocket when he returned to the room and sat down again. She could see, too, that Mr. Rosen had a puzzled look. He didn't know what the packet contained. He didn't ask. It was one more time Anne Marie realized when they protected one another by not telling. If Mr. Rosen knew, he might be frightened. If Mr. Rosen knew what was in the package, he might be in danger. So he hadn't asked. And Peter hadn't explained. So I want you to think back to what our reading job was when I was reading this chapter. We were focusing on Peter and what his actions tell us about himself. What character traits can we think of for Peter? So in our Google document, that is going to be your exit ticket for Number of the Stars. Be thinking, what are some character traits you can give to Peter? And give me evidence from the book that tells us this is the kind of person that Peter is. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I am so into this book. I can't wait to come back tomorrow to read you more. Make sure that you work hard. I miss you and love you all. Have a wonderful Tuesday.